It's a beautiful sunny evening here in South Haven, Michigan for Grid Life Spring Kickoff from Gingerman Raceway. My name's Kyle Heyer, joined in the FCP Euro Race HQ by Nathan Brown <laughs> from FCP Euro. Nathan, welcome. Uh, GLTC race number two this afternoon, 55 cars on the grid. Super excited to be here with you to watch GLTC. Uh, we had an FCP Euro car in the race earlier today, had some issues, but now you get to hang out and watch alongside. Yeah, exactly. Super stoked to be here, uh, you know, at Gingerman. You know, we're here along with Ben Morawski, who is racing over in Fortunate Tech no problem and uh, you know we're here participating and having fun and kind of being a part of the show so super stoked to be here and you're running in track title this weekend as well with the Volkswagen yeah right. I've got the uh, mark 5 GTI running in street class um, first time driving the track here actually it's super fun uh, been learning a lot and you know having a good time well it, it's been a, a fun weekend so far beautiful weather this weekend uh, it's been over 85 degrees in the air the track temp has been well over 100 that means the grip levels have been relatively low earlier today we had a 55 car race we got from point A to point B in, in all of our 15 minutes without having any car contact which was absolutely spectacular however there was some drama that we didn't actually see on the broadcast uh, there was a caution on the far side of the racetrack over in turn 10 B and we had six cars get disqualified for passing under the yellow they were passing a lap car while there was a yellow flag active so Tom O'Gorman was third unofficially he was actually advanced up to the race winner after Jeremy Swenson Emil Tab uh, Andy Smedgard and others were disqualified for passing under the yellow they will start from the tail of the field with the exception of Emil Tab his situation was a little bit different he got a point by from another lap car very confusing but Emil Tab will get to keep his starting position uh, a couple of rows back from the front so we've got the cars rolling now on their second pace lap another spectacular pace car here this weekend we had the Ultimaniac earlier today now a Dodge Viper out front uh, for our pace vehicles. We've had the uh, Wienermobile before. We've also had uh, Lamborghini uh, Huracan before. We've had uh, the Altamaniac, and we also had uh, a real old classic Chevy back at Blackhawk Farmers a, a couple weeks ago. So we had some really cool pace vehicles here in GLTC. But Nathan, this is a, uh, a single class racing series. We race for 15 minute sprints. A super exciting race format, and I love the series because you can basically race anything you want, provided it's 12 and a half pounds per horsepower or somewhere thereabouts. You, you get modifiers for your aerodynamics uh, and any other performance enhancing modifications to the car. It means the, the racing is super close, very competitive. We've got drivers who have run an in-world challenge. We've got drivers who have run IMSA in this field, and they're very successful. We've also got basically everybody from all the other grassroots organizations in the country. It's a stacked grid with, with very, very talented drivers. Yeah, I got to admit, we were here in 2019 for Midwest Festival for the kind of kickoff of GLTC. And to see where it started then, still impressive. And where it's grown now is just kind of mind-blowing. The level of prep on the cars, as you mentioned, the level of drivers, it's extremely competitive. Still a uh, you know, great vibe in the paddock, though. Um, so very different from pro racing and uh, definitely a lot of fun. Yeah, I guess the, the focus on, on fun is something that has been a real uh, pleasant change from a lot of other grassroots organizations that can feel super serious at times. Let me tell you, the racing is serious. But uh, when you get off the racetrack and you can you can uh, fist bump your buddies and, and share a beer after, that's the, the best part about GLTC. Got some on board. That's Eric Cattill in the number 82 uh, hybrid racing EG Civic. Now, uh, Eric Cattill's got a brand new livery on the car this week, so it looks spectacular. One of the best looking race cars I've seen in a long time. So he'll be starting up in the, with the front couple rows. But Tom O'Gorman, again, uh, with his second victory of his GLTC career after the uh, changes and disqualifications from earlier in the afternoon. Got, again, about 55 cars starting here. Uh, and let's take a look here at the Gingerman Raceway track map here. 2.21 miles of racetrack here at Gingerman Raceway. Uh, 11 corners around here, Nathan. It all starts with a run up the hill uh, and just a slight crest down into turn number one, down a couple gears, then into two nearly identical right-handers, kind of double apex, a little bit funky, uh, very flat corners as well before you get through turns four, five, and six. That's a real tricky section. Yeah, four, five, and six is a ton of fun. You basically go flat through four, pitch it in. You can go really, really deep into five, and you kind of, depending upon your car and how much power you have, you can kind of take a couple different lines through there. Um, great momentum uh, through that section and uh, a ton of flow on this track. It's one of the things I really like driving about driving it. It really flows nicely, and uh, it's fun to watch racing here. Then through turns 8, 9, and 10, very, very fast corners. You're carrying a lot of speed. Then up onto the long back straightaway, that's where that, that trouble spot was earlier, getting people caught out by the yellow flag. Then turn 11, one of your best passing opportunities, and back onto the front straight here for GLTC. Now taking the green flag now, starting 
GLTC race number two of the weekend here at Grid Life Spring Kickoff through turn one. O'Gorman and Tab side by side. O'Gorman leads the way through. Alessandrini dropping some tires off. One car way wide. I think that's Eric Meadows who's dropped tires off of the dirt. But through turn two, O'Gorman, Tab, and that's Aaron Lichty, last year's runner up in the championship. And Ryan Upham side by side towards turn number three. A frantic start here, as always, in GLTC. Very frantic, but it looks like everybody kept it clean with the exception of that one car going off. Uh, great to see the BMW up front, of course. We always root for that. Uh, <laughs> Ryan's a great dude, and uh, it's been fun hanging out with him a little bit today. Yeah, the, those BMWs and, and a lot of the uh, BMW M3 platforms have proved to be very, very competitive here in GLTC. Uh, for a while, it seemed like the, the smaller, lighter four-cylinder cars were the ones that were the, the trickiest ones to beat. But lately, we've seen Height Cutters 370, Swenson's Corvette, the M3 combinations. Those have really worked well in this series and have found their way to the front a whole bunch of times. Uh, through turn number seven now, O'Gorman continues to lead, but Tab has not left him far behind, and that K-powered Miata is ridiculously fast in a straight line. So look for turn number 11 to be a good passing zone. Uh, we saw Eric Attil hounding Joel Morrison in the Nine Lives Racing S2000. They're side by side now as they head down towards turn number 10B. And into that corner now, this is one of the slowest corners on the racetrack. You kind of drop off the cliff here, Nathan, before you get up onto the back straight. Yeah, super tricky corner. You're going downhill there. You think you can go deeper than you really can. So it's real tricky not to go too deep and go off on that corner. I've almost done it a couple times myself uh, this weekend. Uh, I think that's Luke McGrew, a little bit slow coming off a of 10B, going to lose some ground here. Change to the number seven uh, coming into this event, and I was kind of joking, that car had a lot of issues with reliability last year and often left the smoke screen, so I was calling him 007 all year long. <laughs> so glad that he's got that car reliable and also changed to a very fitting number. Lap one across the board. Uh, we've lost power here at the racetrack. We're running off a generator, so we will not have timing and scoring up on the screen for you. Uh, we'll do our best to keep you covered with all the action, but O'Gorman leads through turn number two in that ASM uh, heel toe S2000 and looking really solid. Aaron Lichty still behind that M3 though. That car is so good in a straight line. Going to be tough for Aaron to get that pass done. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, it's good to see Tom up front too. It's curious. Uh, you know, he's got he's on uh, a little bit different tire and uh, uh, should should see that car continue to come alive as we uh, kind of go through the uh, race today. It's all a bit of a smoke cloud. It might have just been some dust over at the exit of turn one. So somebody might have had a bit of an off-road excursion. Easy to do here. Uh, the track is relatively wide in, in most areas, and uh, there is some rumble strip there as O'Gorman gets right out to the edge of it. But uh, in some areas, if you step over the limit, there's real deep ruts to the outside of the racetrack as well, Nathan. Yeah, there really are. There's, it's, it's a super safe racetrack. There's not a lot to hit, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's not a penalty if you do go off. Uh, and there's definitely some curbs out there and drop off. Well, that side by side for Aaron Lichty on the outside now of Ryan Upham through turn number eight. That's a gutsy pass all the way out to the track edge. He's got that pass done. And right behind him is Eric Cattill in the, hy or the, the hybrid racing EG on the brakes into 10B. And that's going to open up an opportunity uh, to get that K-powered Civic up onto the back tailpipes of that red M3 down the back stretch. And look at the power again. I'm so impressed with Ryan Upham's build and how much that thing pulls on the straightaways. The different advantages, a slightly heavier car with more power versus is a lighter car with less power. Look at the M3 just drive right by him. Yeah, absolutely. I was curious to see if he could catch up and uh, kind of tuck back under the brakes. Oh! Almost did. Oh, a little yeah. bump there. Yeah, that was a little bit of a dive by Aaron Lichty. You see the hand in the air. He definitely didn't mean to get in there that deep. Uh, Aaron Lichty is one of the few drivers. We got a, a caution flag waving and a debris flag waving for turn number one, so potentially some fluid down. But Aaron Lichty is one of the few drivers out here that does not have ABS. Now, we also see the pace car out on the racetrack. We are under full course yellow here. There's a car up at the exit of turn number or the, towards the entry of turn number three. I think that's Ben Dozeman. Oh, Ooh, that car is, is that fire? definitely uh, has some smoke coming from it. That is Ben Dozeman, uh, and that is uh, the Bad Company Racing number zero, and this is a real shame. Uh, this car had uh, mechanical issues back at Coda. They rebuilt it just for this event, uh, and it has gone up in smoke yet again. That's a real shame. That's a really, really tough break. Uh, you know, everybody out here is working so hard, and uh, when you have mechanical trouble at the track, it's always a bummer. You come back, you put all your time, effort, and uh, kind of blood, sweat, and tears into it, so you, you hate to see that. Yeah, uh, that's really tough, but good to see Ben out of the car very quickly, and, and credit to the safety team for getting there. They were there before I even saw the pace car out, so that's pretty impressive. Yep. So we've got a, a slowdown here. We're going to bunch the field back up. Single file restart. Might take a couple laps to get this spill cleaned up. Uh, and we're not going to know uh, exactly how much time we're going to have left in this race, but we should get at least a couple laps worth of racing. There is Brian Heitkotter way behind the field. That's an interesting one. Uh, he was started at the tail because of the DQ from earlier in the day. I would have expected him to drive forward, but looks like he's actually fallen back. So I'm not sure if he took a trip through pit lane or if he had looped it, uh, but he's still got some work to do. Yeah, uh, you know, Brian's a fantastic driver, you know, won the GT Academy, has raced GT3 cars in uh, World Challenge, so he's certainly got the talent behind the wheel. The car is super fast. 
Um, so yeah, it's, I would expect to see him up a little bit further, but you never can tell what what, uh, what might have set him back a little. Yeah, so the, again, with 55 cars on the racetrack, hard to keep an eye on every single one. Even if you had a drone staring straight down all the time, you'd have a trouble uh, keeping up with everything. Uh, so, Gingerman Raceway, here's a look at the shortcut. That's turn 10A. That's the original construction of this racetrack. And then um, about a decade and a half ago, they added this longer section, turn 10B. And we talked earlier about that dive down the hill. You actually lose a lot of visibility at the exit of this corner, climbing up. You see that little kink in the road. Uh, you can't really see what's on the other side of that, and that's where it caused some of that issue earlier in the day. But this racetrack actually races really, really well. Um, contrary to a lot of the drivers think this place is tricky to pass at, and I would agree, uh, but it certainly bunches people up, and it, it makes it really, really fun to watch. Yeah, and it's kind of kind of has enough of a, a change and difference in corners that, you know, obviously you have a ton of different platforms out there, different power levels, as you mentioned, different grip levels. So every car can kind of give and take in, a, in one section or another. Uh, and, you know, that's ultimately what gives you some of this great racing that we see. For sure. Well, while we're under caution here, we might as well talk a little bit about FCP Euro. Sure. Uh, obviously, uh, you're a European parts distributor, and uh, and we work with you guys a lot. Uh, great to have you here with us as we got the field pulling off. They might red flag this. We're towards the end of the day. We should have time to red flag this, clean this up, and get back green, but we'll see. Uh, but tell me a little bit about FCP Euro, uh, the lifetime parts guarantee. That's my that's my favorite one. Yeah. Uh, uh, t take me through what you guys do. Uh, so essentially, you know, FCP Euro, we sell European car parts online. Uh, we uh, mainly cater to all your major European makes, you know, Audi, Volkswagen, BMW, Porsche, Mercedes-Benz, etc. Um, we have a couple of different things, uh, you know, free shipping over $49, easy returns. Uh, we're exceptionally... Uh, you know, customer focused when it comes to making sure that they get taken care of, no matter the situation ultimately. Uh, but the lifetime replacement guarantee, we basically warranty everything that we sell for as long as you own your car. And it's not a gimmick, it's not anything else, it really does happen. Um, so as long as you can put it back into a container, and get it back to us, we'll return it. We'll basically warranty it for you. So uh, the things that doesn't cover would be aerosols. They can't be put back into right. it. It can. Uh, <laughs> you can fuel, try. <laughs> fuel, you can try. Uh, fuel additives, um, you know, things that get burned off in your gas tank, but anything else, brakes, brake pads, suspension arms, shocks, struts, coilovers, uh, even oil, oil filters, things like that. Um, so it's pretty simple the way it works. Um, say you have a, a car that you buy an oil change kit for, put it in the car, run 5,000 miles, go online, buy another kit, do the change, Take that old oil, put it into the new container, and ship it back to us, and then we will credit you back. I mean, that, I love that. That's great, and it keeps people on the racetrack. Uh, and uh, there's a whole bunch of people here that are running parts purchased from FCP Euro, which is always really cool to see. Uh, you guys also have a racing program and, and a bit of a change for this year as well, uh, running in the IMSA Michelin Pilot Challenge Series with a Mercedes uh, AMG GT4 car, yep. uh, and that uh, that just kicked off a couple weeks ago at Mid Ohio, correct? It, it did. Uh, Mid Ohio was our first race. We skipped the first two at uh, Daytona and Sebring. Uh, so debuted at Mid Ohio. We we qualified 12th out of about 21 cars, which we were very happy with. Um, you know, MP, M Michelin Pilot Challenge is extremely competitive. Uh, so to be able to qualify 12th was great. We ultimately came away with a top 10, uh, coming home in 10th place, which, again, you know, we're super ecstatic for that, really happy for that program. And uh, great as Nate and Michael, uh, who both work for FSPRO and are both of our drivers in that series, um, as they continue to come up to speed with the car and the team comes up to speed with the car, uh, hopefully we'll... Have have some put be able to put on some shows later this year. Oh, really excited! And uh, and one of the drivers that is, that driver that's leading the race has experience in the Michelin Pilot Challenge Series. Uh, Tom McGorman uh, was very successful there. Won four races in the TCR category uh, back in 2018 and 2019, and uh, has found his way into GLTC where he has uh, found a lot of success. Uh, Tom's story was really interesting. He uh, originally had just sort of been jumping in other people's cars. That he bought this S2000 last year, uh, and his first race with it, I believe, was back at Mid Ohio last year. Uh, and it had the original uh, uh, Honda S2000 motor in it. Uh, it was reasonably okay. He was running on street tires. Uh, then he put the K-swap in it over the over the winter after he blew it up at NOLA. And uh, so far, that car has been mighty, mighty quick. Uh, now he's uh, running on slick tires, and he's brought that thing right to the front. And he was telling me earlier that uh, he can still pull weight out of that car. So that that's really, really scary for everybody else in the field. That is. I mean, there's no doubt that Tom's uh, a good pair of hands. Like, he's always been fast. And uh, it's, you know, it was fun watching him in IMSA and things like that. Uh, and, you know, we sell European car parts. I'm generally a European car sure. guy, but those S2000s are kind of hard to uh, <laughs> to not admire yeah. uh, and be a little envious at how quick they are. You know, it's really funny, the, the, the S2000 camp, they're such popular track cars because the, they're, they're plentiful in the aftermarket. They've got tons of parts available for them, but the, the Andy Smedgard Motorsports crew, they've got a handful of them down there in the paddock area. There's five or six of them lined up, and there's still more coming from what I understand. Uh, they, they've got their, their time attack cars all lined up over there as well, so uh, they've really got the, those 
those cars figured out and, and pretty reliable, which is really cool to see. But uh, the S2000 has been a popular car choice. We mentioned the M3. That's a car that we've seen yep. a handful of times. Kerry James, uh, Ryan Upham running that platform. Uh, Honda Civics, we've got Eric Cattill in the 1992. Uh, we've got uh, DJ Alessandrini in the 2006 Civic Si. Now, Alessandrini was also trying the brand new Goodyear Racing Slick this weekend, uh, which uh, we, you know, a lot of the rumors around that tire had speculated that it would be a lot faster than the Hoosier Racing Slick, the R7. Uh, we haven't really seen that to be the case this weekend, which is interesting. I, I saw him post up about that on social media, and I was curious to see how he would do uh, against the Hoosier. I mean, the Hoosier is kind of the, the gold standard in this level of racing and club racing, and uh, uh, it, it could be perhaps the conditions, could be some kind of rubber compatibility issue, or just maybe even finding out what the tire likes. Every tire is very different. You know, if you talk about uh, the Michelin tires we run compared to the Pirellis we've run previously in other programs, they, the tires want completely different setups and everything. And uh, so it might just take a little time for him to kind of dial it in on the SI. And I'm sure a lot of people are watching that to see. I, I know they're, they're slightly cheaper as well. So that's, you know, the almighty dollar is going to for a factor into a lot of those decisions. Also, a whole bunch of drivers that are running the Falcon RT660. That's a really popular street tire for this class, and that, that is a tire that you can be really competitive on if you build your car to a spec where you can run a wide enough tire to, to accommodate that. Uh, I know that Jeremy Swenson's also run a Yokohama street tire. He, th I believe that's what he won on earlier today. Uh, the, the struggle with Swenson's car is how heavy it is. Uh, those tires get real hot real fast, and he just fires out of the gate really, really good, and then he falls back into traffic a little bit later. But so many ways to, uh, to build the GLTC car. So many different formulas and in the past we're like okay all right case swapping the car that's that's the, the formula that was the formula not anymore you can yeah. pretty much be successful in anything yeah it's it's really really cool and I, it, to see just the incredible range of cars the, the different range of horsepower uh just the difference in tires you know ben on his mini is running i think a 225 <laughs> and then you see you know the corvettes and the uh, m3s with these big tires and you wonder how in the world is that car going to be competitive with right you know a proper race car sure uh and it somehow they they kind of stick it all together and it all works uh, the formula that uh adam and and the uh, gltc rules committee have, have put together is Really outstanding, to be honest with you. I mean, it goes to show. I mean, we've, we've got the maximum amount of cars that we can run here at Gingerman Raceway this weekend. And we saw that at Midwest last year, and I'm sure we'll see it again this year. This class has exploded in popularity all across the Midwest. Uh, we've, the field sizes are usually well over 35, 40 cars. So I'm definitely not struggling to get participants, which is great. The other thing that I've noticed is just compared to here a year ago, how much closer the entire field is. The quality of the field has risen immensely. Uh, so many people have started to figure out their builds and, and build them up to a slightly higher uh, competitive spec, and, and it's amazing how much tighter qualifying was on Friday than it was here a year ago. So pretty phenomenal to see that. Uh, we continue to be under a red flag here for uh, Ben Dozman's uh, uh, the Acura RSX, that car had a motor let go between turns two and three, uh, so some oil cleanup potentially to do, and we expect that we should get a green flag here uh, and, and finish out this race. Uh, sunset here in South Haven, Michigan, we're on the very far west edge of Eastern time, so sunset isn't till uh, almost 10 o'clock here tonight, so uh, we got plenty of time. Yeah, it, it's, it's kind of trippy, you know, coming from Connecticut, we drove out here and uh, you know, I think last night it was around 9.30 or something like that. It was still light outside, and, and we couldn't figure out what, what time it was. You know, uh, the, the really late sunsets here are certainly advantageous when it comes to, uh, you know, being able to stop a race like this and uh, get it back underway. I love this. You see the track workers out there working really, really hard, putting the elbow grease in to get the grease off <laughs> of the racetrack, uh, getting the oil dry down and having a look at everything. And there's Adam Jabay there in the cowboy hat on the, the far right, uh, right walking next to the truck, making sure that the track is safe for the competitors. A and I guess the good news is, is that it looks like Ben Dozman was able to get reasonably offline on the straightaway. So uh, even if this doesn't get completely cleaned up, uh, you should be able to stay out of it pretty well. So that, that's, good, that's good to see. And, and Ben did a good job. You can see where the, the, uh, the oil stream veers off to the right after he realized he was laying down oil, got off into the grass. So that was, that was really, really good for Ben Dozman. Um, a lot of times, if you don't realize you're leaking oil, you'll drag the car around the entire track and then cleanup process will take two hours and uh, that would be a bad time. Yeah, absolutely. Super heads up driving there. And, and, and that's kind of something that, you know, uh, we see in the series in general. Um, you know, really tight racing, really close racing, but everybody uh, stays pretty aware uh, and you end up ultimately, you know, minimizing. When you have trouble like this, you kind of, you know, do the best to minimize the off the, the downtime or whatever it might be and, uh, you know, get everybody back underway. And full course yellows are not a, a super common sight in GLTC. I can count on one hand the number of multi-car incidents we've had in three years of action. So we don't see a lot of full course yellows. Uh, what it does do is essentially divides this race in half and it's going to leave in a lot of opportunity for drivers to sort of reset their race. Uh, we started double file so everyone was bunched up, but now single file, you've got a lot more mobility uh, on the front straightaway 
to kind of move around and, and build a run. Uh, once the green flag flies in, in GLTC, unlike a lot of other racing series where you can't pass until the, the start finish line, when the green flag is out, you can race. Whether you're in turn 10, turn 11, wherever you are, uh, when the green flag flies, you're good to go. So that's going to open up a lot of opportunity. You cannot jump the start, obviously, but once the green flag is out, you can build a run and pass 10 cars before you get to the start finish line if you want, uh, which is going to create an interesting dynamic for the restart. Car is up on the rollback, and we should uh, get the rest of that oil dry scrubbed off here shortly. And uh, with the late sunset time, I would expect that the timer has also stopped, so we should get the rest of our race. We were about uh, two or three laps in, so I'd expect four or five remaining in this race. Yeah, I, I would be curious to see uh, how the time uh, uh, sitting in pits affects some of the cars in terms of, uh, you know, heat soak, if any of them are turbocharged. I'm not sure if any of them are at this point, um, but, you know, just tire temps and things like that. Uh, you kind of sit there, you're hot, you're in the car waiting to go back out. Um, so I'll be curious to see who can really take advantage of that uh, and whose equipment is kind of going to be ready right from the rip uh, compared to something that might come up to uh, speed a little bit. Yeah, it's certainly slower. a concern every time that you, sh you shut your car off and you're sort of sitting there on, on pit lane, uh, especially for uh, forced induction cars. I don't believe that we have a whole lot of those uh, in GLTC, partially because the general power area where you're at, the, the popular formats uh, don't really need the, the forced induction to be in the thick of it. Uh, so that, that's not something we see a whole lot of, but if you if you have a turbocharger or a supercharger or something like that, uh, you will have to con be concerned with heat soak and that sort of thing. The other thing is just also what it does mentally. You're sitting around in the pits. You're, you're sort of planning, all right, what did I just do? What can I do in my current spot? You're evaluating your competitors, who you're around, and you're sort of uh, planning out the chess moves five, five moves in advance. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, you know, I'd imagine that uh, some of the more experienced drivers are probably sitting there really plotting it out uh, to see wh what they can take advantage of um, and, uh, you know, make the most of the next couple of laps. The uh, safety truck almost dropped a wheel there. I was, <laughs> I was watching him get real close to the, e the edge of the line there. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that has made, made this a little bit of a challenge here this weekend is we've got Drift back with us, which is great. We love watching our, our slidey bros go for some skids. Uh, the challenge, though, is that they, lay down, they leave a lot of rubber on the racetrack. That rubber gets really hot. It's also in very strange lines because the lines that they're taking. So I'm sure that can uh, can lead to a couple issues. I talked to Emil Tab earlier. He went off in turn number one. Uh, he said there were just marbles everywhere from the drift cars in the prior session. So uh, that's another concern. Uh, also, when you uh, get back down to pace speed, your tires uh, are going to pick up all that clag, all that stuff that's, that's shredded off the tires. And when you go back out there, you better clean your tires off really, really well before you get back to green. Yeah, I actually noticed that in my car. Um, I'm running the, the Falcon RT660s on, on my GTI. They're great tires. I love them. Uh, super grippy. And and uh, with those, I noticed I was getting a lot of pickup. And then I changed over, uh, you know, pulled the wheels off to change some brake, some brake pads. And there's an enormous amount of pickup inside the wheel. Um, so I think uh, you just, there, it's definitely a, definitely a lot of marbles out there. And that's always going to be a challenge for grip uh, until you can get everything uh, cleaned off. You got someone going for a ride here <laughs> with the, uh, <laughs> that that's Grant uh, that's uh, helping us out here with the, the broom and brush. Uh, getting dragged over the oil dry. This is an unorthodox way to do that, but... Uh, that has to be a gingerman invention, maybe? I'm not <laughs> sure. I've not seen that myself. I, I, I kind of like it, though. Uh, I mean, that, that's a unique way to do it. I mean, no no need to drag a whole bunch of weights around. You can get a guy to just sit on it for you. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> So once we brush this all off, I, I, I'm, I actually would would expect, um, it wouldn't be shocking to me if, if when we get back rolling under full course yellow, if the race director asks that the drivers kind of weave through it just to kind of pick it up and disperse it a little bit, just that there's not a, a massive amount of it coming back through when you go back to green, kicks up a big cloud because visibility can be an issue as well. So they might have them run through it. See NASCAR doing that a lot just to kind of disperse all the oil dry so it doesn't create a big plume. Yeah, the other thing too is that, you know, that's, Obviously, he got offline as quickly as he could, but if somebody was going in for a pass going into that turn, that's turn three, I believe, yep. uh, you know, if you're on the inside, you're coming up and you've got that oil dry on your tires, you might have previously had a lot more traction, uh, go up the inside and then lose it and then potentially have an incident. So, yeah, definitely would have wanted to get that uh, off the racing track as, uh, as much as possible. And turn three is one of the tightest corners on the racetrack as well. So the speed difference between where you begin your braking point and your, your min speed in the corner is pretty significant. So you want to make sure that you're braking. I also mentioned, earlier that Aaron Lichty is one of the few cars out here towards the pointy end of the field that doesn't have ABS. Uh, so if you lose grip, lock up the tires, then you're on along for a real ride. That's one thing that we've seen a lot of is uh, a lot of drivers switching over to ABS, a lot of drivers using BMW ABS systems, uh, putting those in cars, which I thought was interesting. Uh, I know Eric Attil added uh, some Honda-based ABS uh, in his car, which uh, I believe is working pretty well. He's running fairly decent. But uh, a lot of, of ABS uh, has come into the, the, the series lately, which is really interesting to me. I think a lot of drivers have, have watched this in the pass, especially the rain races, and go, mm, you know what, that might be worth the cost. Yeah, that, the ABS is one of those technology pieces that uh, absolutely ends up being helpful in the long run. The uh, I think it's the uh 
the Mark 60 or MK60 uh, BMW E46 M3 unit that everybody uses. Uh, and we actually use that in our C300 AER endurance car that we did run a couple GLTC, ra GLTC races in. Uh, and it's a really nice system because you essentially, it's plug and play. It's a standalone uh, OEM unit and it works exceptionally well uh, if you just take that and put it into a race car. Yeah, I, 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 I I might be wrong about this, so Emil will have to correct me, but I think that's what Emil Tab is running in his car. He was testing it. Uh, he, he first put it in for Coda uh, back in February, and uh, he was breaking full markers later than everybody else. It's just so nice to be able to basically plant the pedal to the floor and let the computer do the work for you. And especially when the conditions get a little bit crappy with the uh, with you know with rain or something like that, uh, it really allows you to, to trust your brakes a little bit more uh, and, and not be uh, super sketched out. Mid Ohio uh, is a track that we always get some rain at, and that place is slick always yeah. but especially in the rain so good to have a little bit of a backup there yeah it's one of those things where uh you know in in a, a, a day like today you know it's been pretty warm track temps are very high and you have the drift drivers out there so your grip is going to be changing you know throughout the day so what you could do in you know an earlier session earlier race you may not necessarily be able to do uh, and the abs kind of gives you that little bit of cushion potentially to uh, avoid flat spotting a tire uh, or you know blowing a corner completely if uh, you have a little less grip than you anticipate for sure. So the cleanup is almost complete here at Gingerman Raceway for Gridlife Touring Cup Spring Kickoff, race two of the weekend. We've got four races. The final race of the weekend will have a, a random invert uh, for about the top 15 drivers. There's a random a random choice in there that can uh, mix that up just a little bit. Uh, speaking about the points picture just a little bit, Luke McGrew came into the weekend leading the points by about 19 over Aaron Lichty. Uh, Aaron has eaten into that lead just a little bit, and I imagine if things continue to go as they are, we might see Aaron Lichty take the points lead away, uh, which which is interesting because last year it was a battle between Aaron Lichty and Erica Till for the season championship. We have drop races in this series, and the championship was a four-point swing between no drop races and drop races included. So those two are going to be, again, in a head-to-head -head battle probably all season long. But Cattill still has some work to do back at NOLA, the 2021 season opener. Uh, he discovered himself that he was underweight and illegal for uh, a couple of the races that weekend and self-reported. Lots of integrity in the series, which is great, but he lost a whole bunch of points and has some work to do to dig out of that hole. Yeah, absolutely. And it's one of the things that kind of speaks to the competitors and attendees and everybody that's sort of in that Grid Life family. It's one of the reasons that, that you know, FCP Euro partners with Grid Life, you know, it's about having fun, um, being out on track with your friends and buddies, uh, everything like that. You know, you have drivers from all over the place in terms of uh you know their backgrounds and everything like that and everybody's just here to have fun and you know that kind of level of respect is uh really good to see and we, we had that here this weekend yeah there's there's adam <laughs> jabay giving the thumbs up <laughs> love it um but we had this that same situation happen this weekend with todd Cayley, who is currently case swapping his s2000 and I was borrowing a friend's car to race here this weekend, so running a completely different chassis. Uh, set up for a NASA category, was running about 230-ish horsepower. Needed to get the car down to just a little over 200. Well, there was an issue with the throttle body, and before it ended up coming here, uh, without his knowledge, the team had removed the throttle body, and uh, I guess or removed the restrictor off of the throttle body, and, and I guess that never got communicated. So he came here and ran qualifying and then uh, went to the dyno and realized, uh-oh, I'm way overpowered and way underweight. So he added over 200 pounds of ballast to that car wow. and was still 10 pounds short of being legal, but he did self-report that to Renee Hines, uh, and, uh, w which Todd's a great guy, and it was just we had a, a fun conversation about it. <laughs> he added uh, me to the car. I could just go ride with them and get them over and then legal weight. I mean, <laughs> dynamic ballast, it's not a bad idea. Basically, <laughs> put you in the car, have you do commentary live. You know, I would from love that. That would be so <laughs> fun. I, we, uh, DJ Alessandrini has a passenger seat in his car we, we chatted about that and adam said heck no we're not yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> probably a little bit sketchy potentially uh, yeah, I would uh, in the heat of battle man I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna lean into him though i really want to <laughs> do that that'd be super fun uh, so with uh, with Kaylee doing that though, he is now all set and, and all legal with that extra uh, extra weight that he found, uh, and I, I don't not exactly sure where he is in the field, but uh, coming forward, that car is very very fast, and Todd is extremely good. His first race in GLTC was back at Road Atlanta in 2019, which is, I believe is the last time Mercedes uh, ran uh, with FCP Euro. Yep. Um, that was a really fun weekend. That was about a 40 car field, and uh, that was also the last race that or one of the last races that we had the uh, HMA Racing Hot Odyssey, the uh, 2018 oh, yeah. Honda Odyssey minivan that race in GLTC finished 18th out of the weekend out of the 38 cars, which is really cool. Yeah, the uh, C300 and the uh, the Hot Rodicy, I think you called yeah. it. Um, I, we just know it was an Odyssey, and that thing uh, was unbelievable how good it was under braking. Uh, and to see that car out there racing with little Honda Civic hatchbacks, the C300 little German sedan, 
uh, was just absolutely a riot. There, there was a, a picture in turn one on the the inside apex of turn one. It's my favorite picture I've ever seen from GLTC. There is a, a turbocharged uh, Mazda Miata next to a V6 Mustang next to the, the Honda Odyssey. And they're all three wide. And I thought that was the greatest picture, the, the perfect representation of what GLTC is. And thankfully, we just saw the HMA Racing uh, Facebook uh, page basically say that they pulled the car out of storage and they started running it again, getting it warmed back up. So we might see that in the future. And I don't know when it's coming back, but uh, soon is, is what I understand. So I'm really, really excited to see that car back. That would be super exciting. And, and it kind of speaks to you know, what we've talked about multiple times on the broadcast is that there are so many different kinds of cars. And really, if if you're a fan of a chassis or a fan of a platform, you know, Ben he's has minis. He loves minis. He's building a mini for GLTC. Um, you know, have that technical issue, but you know, whatever you're into, you can build it yeah. and uh, and potentially make it competitive with the uh, the right combination of uh, power or power and aero. There was another Mini Cooper that was uh, that was at some point planning on running GLTC, and I don't know where the status of this car is, but it was one of the real old classic Minis. Oh wow! It was going to run with a bike motor, and that would have been a lot of fun to see. So I'm hoping that car will make it out to an event at some point this year. Uh, but again, I mean, wh what a ride it would be to watch a Honda Odyssey race a Mini Cooper. That would be spectacular. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe half the size of that minivan. <laughs> I'm not sure. You'd probably fit it in the back of the of the Honda. You probably could. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, pretty pretty phenomenal. Yeah, Do you know what that what the mini makes off, makes power wise off the top of your head? Ben's car. Yeah, uh, it's a little over 200 wheel horsepower. Okay. I'm not lot. sure. Um, yeah, he's uh, he's been kind of having some struggles with it to get it you know on point to make sure he did a lot of changes before this race. Suspension, um, s you know, aero has changed things like that. Um, so he was kind of right on the limit in terms of uh, horsepower to weight, um, but. Uh, uh, yeah, just kind of struggle with it a little yeah. bit. 200 horsepower is a lot for a mini, though. That, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, as we roll off now, we're gonna are gonna get a reset here and, and go again. We probably will get uh, maybe one more pace lap. We could go green this time by. We'll see what the lights in the pace car will be doing by the time we get to the back half of the course. The black and red and white car that just passed the center of your screen, that's Eric Jensen in his second GLTC appearance. His first was back at NCM Motorsports Park back in April. That car is an LS-swapped Scion FRS. Now, I, I own uh, a Scion FRS now as of a couple months ago. That platform is super, super fun. But with an LS power plant, you don't have to worry about the reliability of it so much. Uh, that's a really cool car. Eric's been uh, performing very, very well. And uh, his son is also running in Time Attack here this weekend. So kind of a family outing. Really, really cool to see. So glad to have Eric with us uh, and running in the FRS. Yeah, I saw you uh, post that you got that FRS. So congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I really like those cars. Yeah. It's, uh, again, uh, you know, it's one of those cars that I look at and I'm just like, you know what? I think I like that. I wouldn't mind buying one of yeah. those. Uh, and uh, a buddy of Ben's actually was ha uh, running uh, HPDE this yep. weekend, and I sat in it, and I was like, this feels a little too right. Yeah. So I don't know. We'll it, see what happens. I, I got a chance to track it at Blackhawk Farms a couple weeks ago, and uh, I was still relatively new to track driving, so I wasn't quite at the limit of the car. I've got uh, like uh, $85 GT radials on it, but they're 225s, a little, little thicker than, mm -hmm. than stock, uh, and I just had so much fun. It's such a great well-balanced chassis. Uh, one of the cars we're missing here this weekend is Pervez Randalia, who has run uh, an, an FRS in the series before. Uh, he was running with the FA20 motor. He did a whole bunch to it to make it reliable, and then had made some small tweaks to rev it a little bit higher, and that's when it popped. But he had run for two years with the FA20 in it. It was probably the fastest unmodified internal uh, FA20 motor with the FRS in the country. It was ridiculous, uh, and uh, hoping that Pervez can make it back out later this year. Not sure what the plans are for that car, if it's going to get another FA20, or if it'll get a case swap from the winning formula guys but uh, either way great chassis um yeah i posted a lot about mine on social media i love it so much that it's, <laughs> it's basically the only thing that's interesting about my personality so, <laughs> so that's that's all that's been on on social media for me for the last three months uh, so. you, you post what you're excited about and that's you yeah. know something definitely to be excited about so. all right pace car off restarting here for gltc race number two from gingerman raceway tom o'gorman emil tab ryan upham erica till and aaron lichty your front five green flag back in the air look at emil tab a good run up the inside here Will he have overlap for turn one? Just a little bit as they get down to the left-hander. Leaves plenty of space, does O'Gorman. Now crossing back over for turn number two. It's real tight from second on back. Yes, yeah, uh, it looks like uh, a pretty clean start for Tom. Uh, it was getting pretty close there, but, you know, really respectful uh, with everybody giving room and uh, got through clean. There's Ryan Upham, has a look up the inside of uh, Emil Tab. Couldn't quite get overlap, though. There's Aaron Lichty right on the tailpipe. So those are your two uh, front runners from the championship last year. Three wide at the exit of turn three. That is Luke McGrew uh, alongside, uh, or is that Justin Lee in the 33 car? No, that is McGrew alongside Eric Jensen, Lewis Chatroop, and Jake Price behind. And there's Alessandrini at the, the tail of that group in the Goodyear tired. Uh, 
uh, Honda Civic SI. But O'Gorman leads by about five car lengths into turn seven, and it's getting real racy up in the front seven here. Yeah, there's not a lot of time to uh, make something happen, so everybody is uh, is going to be trying their best to, to, to get ahead uh, as quickly as they can. Yeah, so two discrete groups forming here at the front. We're watching the front one on board with Eric Till there for a moment. All over the back of Ryan Upham on the run down to turn 10B. We'll see if he pops out a line. Bit of a defensive line for a moment for Upham. Moves back onto the racing line for turn 10B. Now that we're getting into where the M3 is really, really solid onto this back straight here. But a bit of a, a bobble there at corner exit, but it's it all gone here up on the straightaway. That M3 is a rocket ship. Yeah, he really stretches it out. I was curious to see if Eric could be able to get a good dig out of that corner with the, that car being front wheel drive and so much lighter. But the M3 just puts the power down and uh, kind of scoots away. He gained about 15 car lengths on that straightaway and caught all the way up to Emil Tab. That is really, really impressive. Uh, up on, I believe, last year, uh, unofficially won a race before he got DQ'd for uh, passing under the yellow. So uh, he, that, that car is a, a very well-tuned chassis for this racetrack, and uh, he's made it very, very competitive. You see the background there is Joel Morrison in the Nine Lives S2000, just behind them, Jeremy Boysen in the 99 Acura RSX, and uh, front 10. Now stretching out, there's McGrew, Jensen, Lewis Chatroop, Alessandrini now up into the mix. On board with Eric Cotill and the hybrid racing EG. One of the nicest looking cars, not only on the outside, but on the inside. You should see Cotill's engineering work to put that ABS system in. It looks like it came out of the factory like that. It's so, so well done. Yeah, it's all about attention to detail in these things. And one of the things that uh, you mentioned are the liveries. I got to say, everybody's stepping up their livery game. You, know, yeah. you see the ASM crew. Yep. Every car has a variation of that same livery. It really looks great when they're all lined up, uh, parked side by side in the no, is still yet to get it. So there's, they're going to have more of those as the season goes on. Watch this again as we come up out of the hole in 10B. That uh, oh, Actually, we're not quite there yet. But a uh, bit of a smoke plume from Emil Tab there. I'm not sure if that car just... Well, you know what that is? It's just dirt. They're just clipping the edge of the racetrack there a little bit. Some side-by-side -side beyond about 15th place, but O'Gorman keeping that gap fairly constant and uh, setting a pace that he can maintain, and that's part of maybe Tom's pro experience. You don't need to lead this race by 15 seconds. You just got to cross the line first. Yeah, I was kind of wondering that, actually, because he kind of scooted out, and he's maintained that almost exact gap the entire time, so almost certainly trying to save the tires and save the brakes a little bit just in case somebody does get start getting close uh, so he can, you know, potentially take home the win. And there goes Ryan Upham past Emil Tab for second place, and now we'll set his sights on Tom O'Gorman for the top spot here on the front straightaway. And Emil Tab got a pretty good run out of turn number 11, has a look up the inside for turn number one. We'll see if he can get alongside. Not quite. Grab some dirt through turn one to hook the car around. Uh, Eric Cotill now hounding the front here uh, in the hybrid racing EG through turn two. It's a three-car battle for second. Yeah, it's really, really tight through there, and uh, it looks like these guys are pretty well, well, well matched when it comes to overall pace. Uh, I'm curious to see if Uppen's able to uh, stretch it out a little bit uh, as the car kind of gets through the rest of the track and gets to uh, an area where it really kind of put that power down. Looks like Emil Tab might be fading just a little bit. Cotill uh, now running the gap down there, but look at Uppen. This is where the weight is going to cost Uppen here. That's where Tab's going to close the gap, but it's really difficult to pass through this section of the racetrack, so uh, they'll probably stay in line there. Cotill with a great run on Tab. Had a look in the background. You see, I think that is, uh, that is the RSX of... Uh, is that Jeremy Boyce? Jeremy Boyce. Okay, yeah. yeah. It was a little bit wide. Try to see who was alongside him. I think it was Luke McGrew. Yeah, I, I really love that RSX because that's an X-World Challenge Pro car, uh, and it's so cool to see that out there. Somebody's still racing it, still putting it to you know to use. Uh, which, you know, it's, you see old race cars, it's sad to see them when they get you know, put in mothballs. Yeah, it's, it's also been uh, a really solid race car over the, the couple of years that Jeremy's been racing that here in the series. As you see now, Eric Cotill going to tuck back in behind Emil Tab. There's a car off to the right. That is Tiffany Kelly. Now, this is a really similar situation to what happened in race one earlier today where we had a car off track at the exit of 10B. Caution flag is going to be out at the corner station there. Now, the tricky thing is you might also get a yellow flag in turn nine. You might think you're good, but you cannot pass until you see a corner station without a yellow flag that will be over here in turn 11. So no passing on that straightaway now, which is going to be a real challenge uh, when your best passing zone is now gone. That is quite a stretch, actually, and uh, that's, you know, precisely the place where somebody that's uh, got a good run or has a little bit more power wants to make that move. Uh, and it takes a lot of restraint to uh, you know, keep the red mist down and, and, and hold your line. Look at uh, Eric Cotill all over Emil Tab again, hounding him. 
darting left and right in the mirrors. He knows now that with that car offline, he's not going to have the passing opportunity that he wants. So he's going to have to force it somewhere else. A skip and a hop over the curbs through turn three. Now three car lengths between them. We'll see if Cotill can use that front wheel drive to claw his way forward. One of the nice advantages of front wheel drive, you get loose, hammer down, you're going to get it. And yeah. get it under control. Absolutely. And there's a couple spots on this track that you can really do that. Unweight the car, uh, get the rotation in there, and then put the, uh, put the power down. Through turn number seven now, Gorman's lead expanding now to about eight to nine car lengths. There, whoop, there's a car off. That's Todd Cayley at the exit of turn number six. That's a spin for Cayley. He'll get that car back rolling by the looks of it and get back moving. So good to see Cayley uh, back rolling again. That's an easy spot to drop a right rear tire off at the exit of turn five. We're rolling into turn six. Another car off here at the exit. That is... Uh, it's a black car. I can't quite get the look at the number of that, but 10B has been a real trouble spot this weekend. Yeah, it's been pretty slick. Um, you know, I don't really have a frame of reference for it, but I've heard a couple other drivers saying that it's a little bit more slippery than ideal track conditions. And if you're, you know, going for every 10th, that's certainly a corner that could catch you out uh, as it goes downhill. Onto the front straightaway this time through O'Gorman leads by about eight to nine car lengths over Ryan Upham across the line here with yellow flags uh, all over the last uh, couple stretches of the racetrack. White flag is out one more time around Gingerman Raceway. 2.21 miles left for O'Gorman. If you were to win this race, it'd be his third win in the last three races. He's, he's having a pretty good role here this weekend. Yeah, it's when you're hot, you're hot. You know, it's one of those things where you uh, kind of get over that, that he, you know, get, got the initial win. All the pieces are coming together and uh, really making his way to the front. Well, there is Eric Meadows in the number three. There's Jeremy Swenson in the purple Corvette. He was one of the drivers that had a disqualification for passing under the yellow earlier while leading. He was the unofficial winner from race one earlier. A lot of dust all over the racetrack. Uh, with the temperatures climbing, the track has sort of dried out offline. And there's, oh, there's Jeremy Boysen going for a ride off in the dirt. It is really slick out there. I wonder if there might be some other fluids around, maybe from Tiffany Kelly's car, uh, that could be causing this. Uh, it's certainly a possibility, um, you know, uh, at, at this point, you know, maybe everybody's just pushing that hard, but to see that many people going off, uh, you'd think there might be something down. So this is going to be a, a, the same exact scenario we had in race one, a slower lapped car coming up to a yellow flag zone. You cannot pass here. We had drivers get disqualified. This is what we were worried about happening again. You cannot pass right now. They're forced to stay in line until the exit of turn 11. O'Gorman's through. He's gone. For a second, though, have to wait, wait, wait until you pass the next flag stand. This is absolutely critical. Oh. And at this point, they're giving up. They're going. So this is going to be a disqualification for Upham, Tab, uh, Cotill and Aaron Lichty unless they get a grace from the race control. That's a real tough situation. That is really, really tough. And it's, you know, if, you're, if you've got your head down and you're trying to go for the win uh, and you're fighting with those guys, you, you, you might not have seen it. You, you know, you put the blinders on and you're just, you know, focusing on uh, trying to. Oh, man, I do not envy Renee Hines having to make decisions on this race. Congratulations to Tom O'Gorman. <laughs> we were talking about all that. He won his third race of his career. O'Gorman sweeps the first two races of the weekend here in GLTC. He has somehow avoided all the drama and continues uh, to add to his collection of race wins. And this, this makes me so happy to see uh, Tom so driven by com competition and racing and to see him back in victory lane again. And this time, he truly earned it out front and just beat everybody. Yeah, a racer, you know, will take a win no matter how they can take a win. But to, to do it on merit, I guess, or on pace and uh, to kind of seal the deal, control really control the race from start to finish, uh, he's got to feel pretty good about that. Yeah, phenomenal performance. And that time, you know, he just controlled the race so beautifully, never got too far out front, never overheated the tires. Uh, waving out the window again this is uh, this is exactly where he wants to be and uh, you know I think it also helped that some of the the competition uh, had the DQ earlier in the weekend now we'll see where they shake out for race number three he will start on pole for the third race of the weekend uh, because your your grid position for tomorrow's race three is set by the finishing order from race two so he will start on pole and then race four if he wins that one he'll he'll get inverted somewhere in the field and then he'll have to really pass a whole bunch of cars to make that happen so uh, that was it. I mean, that, that was a wild one with the full course <laughs> caution and the whole uh, yeah. caution issue. Man. Uh, <laughs> this is, Happy to this be here wild. for this one, you know. Yeah. It's, uh, it was fun. Uh, yeah, really curious to see what if there are disqualifications from that uh, yellow flag zone. Uh, not only what that would mean for the weekend, but for the season championship, because those are all top drivers. All top drivers and all in a in championship battle. Now, I, I, I can only speculate, but the, the real challenge uh, with 
with that situation is the drivers knew it. They they known about the situation, known about the DQs from the previous race, and they they tried. They waited, they waited, they waited, and I think at some point they just said, you know what, tack with it. We're just stacking everybody up, and we're going to go. And they might get a grace from the race director, seeing that they didn't want to do it, and then they saw that the track was safe. They had passed the incident. So I can only speculate to what the decision making will be. Uh, but I would imagine if there is any point at which you will get, uh, you know, a, a pass on something like that, that would have been the situation. Yeah, it really comes down to safety, and like you're saying, the field starts stacking up if you can't see what's ahead somebody starts to go off one way or the other and uh, you don't want any contact you don't want collisions you don't want bent metal um, so ultimately there may may be the decision that was the safe and prudent thing to do once they were through that zone right so uh, we'll, we'll see what happens we'll update you tomorrow for race number three and again thanks for bearing with us with the power outages here at gingerman raceway uh, a little bit of, of trouble <laughs> good life live off grid <laughs> with the comic stands i love that uh, and the drone doing some tricks that's that's also really cool on the front straightaway here so that's going to do it for uh, the gltc action for today make sure you join us again tomorrow for the final two races of the weekend and wow all sorts of cool tricks happening on camera now i'm kyle hire alongside nathan brown from fcp Euro. we'll join you again i think nathan you'll be with me for race number four uh i will yeah absolutely cool. so uh, i'll be with you guys tomorrow again for race number three but race four will be myself and nathan again for the final race of the weekend thanks for watching